the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, the uh, second conference we're going to talk about is uh, related, of course, to the first, the sanctifying grace. How does a person obtain sanctifying grace? Uh, well, you obtain sanctifying grace, first of all, by baptism. We know that. Uh, but to a larger degree, we obtain sanctifying grace and increase in it uh, by our participation in the sacraments, obviously, uh, uh, the sacrament of confession and Holy Communion uh, as frequently as, uh, as we can. As we die, whatever amount, so to speak, whatever amount of sanctifying grace we are in is what will be correspondingly given to us as the light of glory in heaven. Now, my mother, God rest her soul, being of the old Irish uh, turf, used to say that some people would have more jewels in their crown in heaven than others. Okay, well, like we said, every analogy fails, <laughs> but it's helpful, it's helpful to try to understand what we're talking about when we're talking about being in heaven. When we're in heaven, we are in the presence of God, but not just in and looking, but we, through the, uh, through the infused virtue of charity, we begin to love God as God loves himself. Now, this is a far different cry than how we kind of think of charity on a day-to-day -day basis. Charity meaning being nice to each other and that sort of thing, which is certainly good and true and fine. But in the supernatural realm, when our lives are done and we're in heaven, please God, that the participation in charity that we have will, be, will enable us to love God as he loves himself. So it is a pure, pure charity. And to the degree we are able to participate in that will be the degree of the light of glory that is uh, shown to each of us in our, own, uh, in our own particular circumstances. So a person is, uh, who dies further along in the spiritual life than someone else has a greater capacity to be able to uh, absorb the light of glory and thereby increase or be increased in charity, which is being able to uh, love God as he loves himself. So much is vested in this life because all of this is kind of set at the moment of death. So lots of people have this kind of vision of heaven and hell, which is well, in one sense, kind of like the Islamic notion of heaven. If you lift, listen to Islam, uh, Islamic scholars or any imams, the, the, the priests, so to speak, of uh, uh, the clerics of, Muslim, of uh, Islam, they have sort of a futurized version of earthly life. It's not something different from, it's just kind of the good things of this life just kind of on steroids. That's sort of what Islamic heaven is like. So the idea that, you know, since one of the things that's valued here on earth, way overvalued here on earth, is sex, well then one of the things that's val valued and sort of pushed up on steroids in Muslim heaven is, uh, you know, is the 72 virgins thing we hear all the time. It's all about just taking kind of the pleasures of earth and just expanding them. And that notion uh, has kind of worked its way into popular culture as well, even within Christianity. It's a bad way to view heaven. It's a bad way to view hell. If lots of people sit around and say, well, you know, I'll be in hell, but at least I'll have a lot of company. And we were joking here and setting up the tables yesterday that, you know, well, you know, if I wind up in hell, at least there'll be a lot of rock bands down there with me. So... <laughs> We were, uh, that was a joke, trust me, nobody was really meaning that. Um, but it, it, the problem with that view is it, it denies or doesn't allow for the greater understanding of what heaven and hell are. They are, each one of them is so far beyond our, uh, uh, our visualization that it's not just like, well, you know, heaven's this nice place where you hang around with friends and hell's this horrible place where you hang around with people that aren't so good and that's it. No. 
No, the extremes of these are from like one universe to another. They're not just, you know, kind of houses across the street from each other. These are universes apart. And one, again, I'll stress this every talk, one is the possession of God. When our Lord was sitting around with uh, his disciples around him and he was preaching to the crowds, if you recall at one point, I believe it's in Matthew's Gospel, uh, he says to them, the kingdom of heaven, behold, is among you. It's right there. It was physically right there that where Christ is, because where Christ is, so is the Father and the Spirit, so where the Trinity is, is heaven. Now, the problem was the people sitting around weren't in possession of it. They were looking at it. Some believed, most didn't. But even the ones who believed and the ones who believed the most, we would probably say the one who believed the most, and maybe they'd argue amongst themselves. We could certainly make a case that St. John believed the most. He was the one standing there at the foot of the cross while all the others were, you know, all you saw were their backs. And um, you could also make the case that John was the youngest and therefore the most naive and stupid and didn't realize he shouldn't have been standing there because he might be crucified himself. Nonetheless, he's standing there, but, you know, John is the beloved disciple. So what separates him even on this score? The closest one to the kingdom of heaven, which is Christ, is the one who loves the most. Why? Because in that charity, in that charity, he begins to be able to love God the way God loves himself. And what is the love of God? It's the, it's the relationship. You know, we think of God as a thing. Uh, the Holy Trinity, God is a relationship. We, don't, we know this kind of intuitively. We don't really think about it that much. But, you know, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and, of course, because we're uh, human and uh, the second person of the Trinity took on flesh and we behold the second person, and St. Paul tells us that you know, he is the image of the invisible God, we still sit and look at Jesus and think God, which is true, but just beyond the, the, the human nature that we can see, of our Lord and the second person is that relationship of love, infinite love between Father, Son, and Spirit. And that's what we really, that's the relationship that we're stepping into in heaven. Think of God as kind of a singular, and we always say he this and he that, and that's true. But again, this is a, somebody's question earlier during the last break. You know, every analogy in the end fails. So you always have to have these kind of, yeah, this is a way of saying it, but it doesn't quite capture the whole thing. And here's another way of thinking about it, but it doesn't quite capture it all. So uh, what we are destined for, what we were created for, was to be in the relationship that is enjoyed between the Father, Son, and Spirit. That is our destiny. That is where we are supposed to be. And to the degree that we uh, participate in charity and are charitable, we are able to see and understand and love God as he loves himself, that relationship between them. So where, does, where is this relationship of love best demonstrated between Father, Son, and Spirit? Because wherever that relationship is best demonstrated, where it's best exhibited, where we have a tangible hold on it, that is where we are able to find sanctifying grace in its foremost uh, uh, location. Well, since the relationship of love between Father, Son, and Spirit is a total pouring out, a nothing being withheld, Nothing. Definition of love. The more you love, the more you sacrifice. And the more you sacrifice, the more you empty yourself. Or somebody had said earlier, the more you decrease while someone else increases. It's the nature of love. So, as we look at the Trinity, where do we see that happen the most? We see that happen in our Lord's obedience even unto death on the cross. He obeys his Father's will perfectly there, out of love for Father and man. 
that he wants to absorb us into this and clear the way for us to come into this. So this is the supreme moment of charity, perfect charity. Where do we have access to that now? At Catholic Mass. This is the importance of the Mass. And this is why some people, when they walk up to Holy Communion, are just totally oblivious to what's going on. It's why the grace of the sacrament never gets beyond them. They're not participating in the love of the action. They're simply participating in the physical action. Stroll up, chew their gum, talk, wave, look around. That's not, are they participating in the sacrament? Sure. Are they obtaining the grace from that sacrament? Well, probably not very likely. It's there, it's offered to them, but if you walk up to Holy Communion, if you walk up to the Holy Communion of Niagara Falls or the Niagara Falls of Holy Communion with your thimble and you stick your thimble in the falls, well, you're going to walk away. I don't care if it was Niagara Falls or not. You're only walking away with a thimble full. If, however, like these saints, you walk up there with your, you know, L.A. River Basin and fill it up, well, then you walk away with that. So the outpouring of charity, of sanctifying grace that is available to us is infinite. You have to understand that. It's infinite. It's how much we participate in it by our part of it. God pours it out infinitely. Do we walk up there with the capacity to receive that infinitude? Well, no, because we aren't infinite. But with the maximum exposure of our finiteness, do we walk up there with that capacity? Yes, and the funny thing about that is our capacity is kind of like a balloon that doesn't have any air in it. Sort of the more you put in it, the more it expands and increases its capacity. Now, again, the analogy fails because eventually the balloon's going to burst, but pretend it's an unburstable balloon. So the more you put in it, the more it's going to expand. Well, as you die, do you have a tiny little balloon? Or actually, did you get rid of your balloon? Oh, you don't, want to you don't want to show up to the great circus in the sky with no balloon. Not a good thing. But likewise, you don't want to show up with some little biddly thing. You want to show up with a hot air balloon, full, as big as it could possibly get. Because when that is translated into the next life, that's how much your capacity to be able to receive and love God as he loves himself. That's, where, that's what you have. So the light of glory given to you in the next life is, is exactly proportional to that. This is why Mass is so important. This is why Mass is so important. Mass is important whether I'm at it or not, whether you're at it or not. Something is there in that Mass that is key to salvation. And it's participating in this act of love. And what is the act of love? It's not just showing up at Mass. It's being present to, again, the supreme act of love, of charity, that the Son shows the Father. And because of that, when we go in that and participate in that, that love demonstrated in time 2,000 years ago outside, of the hill, uh, outside the hill on Jerusalem, that love is eternal and you step into it. You step into it at Mass. And during that sacrifice, during that sacrifice of the Mass, what's going on? This is what we, these are the things you have to think, and since it's so hard to think about this when someone's banging on bongos and strumming a guitar and singing some horrible song. <laughs> this is why the abuses at Mass have to be brought to an end. People have to be able to concentrate and think on these things. They need to be able to sit and dwell on what's going on. What's really going on here? This isn't a, uh, you know, we're all having a bit of a lunch around a table and God's our chef. Woo! Yes. Is the love of God 
demonstrated to us in the material world through food? Yes. Through this particular food? Yes. Is it a gathering around as a community? Yes. But those are the secondary things. The primary things is this is a sacrifice. This is the sacrifice of Calvary brought back to us, represented to us. Because this is the supreme moment of charity. This is the statement of love between father and son. This moment is what all of history has inclined toward and flown from. All of it. When God says to the serpent, I will put hatred between you and the woman, between her offspring and yours, and she will crush your head, and you will lie in wait and strike at her heel. At that moment, the way was being prepared for this act of love to be expressed between Father, Son, and Spirit. At that very moment, when Adam fell, thanks Eve, when Adam fell, <laughs> God could have said, that's it, I wash my hands of you. Adam and Eve, there you go. Meet your serpent friend, what he really looks like. Close the door on created history and been done with it. God is under no obligation whatsoever to have redeemed man. Obviously, he wasn't under an obligation to create him, but he was under no obligation to redeem him once fallen. But God so loved man that at that instant, at the instant of our fall, he put into place the first brick on the road to redemption. That moment of redemption, which is the supreme act of love, is what we witness with our own eyes at Mass. Now, lots of people are like, well, that's, you know, it doesn't look the same, and you know, it's unbloody, and fine. All of that's the case. It doesn't look the same. But think about this for a moment. When our blessed Lord was walking around on earth during his public days, his Galilean ministry, what did he require from people? Faith. What did he want them to believe in? He wanted, to look, he wanted them to look beyond his humanity, the physicalness of him, and recognize that he is God. That's what he demanded of them. So when people would come to him and say, uh, you know, can you cure this? Or my, my, you know, the centurion, my son, he's like a, or my slave, he's like a son to me. But all these people, they're making an act of faith. Oftentimes somebody would come to Jesus and say, you know, can you cure me or somebody? And he always said to them, do you believe I can do it? He demanded an act of faith on their part, not just a thought, not just a hope, but an actual act of faith. Do you believe, yes or no? And what they were believing in, ultimately, was his divinity. Only God's performing miracles, or even if someone is performing miracles, it's still being God is the origin of the miracle. So. He was asking them, do you believe I'm God? And if they answered, yes, Lord, I believe you can do this, or okay, then he would go ahead and do it. Interestingly enough, we have that one disturbing line, um, I believe it's in Mark's Gospel, where it says, he could perform no miracles there because of their lack of faith. So, as we look at, as we look at the, the, the question of faith, the first generation of Christians, the people who were uh, blessed enough to see our Lord in the flesh walking around on earth, why would they be required to uh, perform this great act of faith, but no other generation beyond them be required to perform the same act of faith? It's no less an act of faith on our part today to look at what appears to be bread and wine and say, Yes, Lord, I believe that through that physical reality in front of me, you are God, that that is you. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. What is before us there in the host and the chalice and the precious blood is the divinity of our Lord. That's ultimately what he's asking. Do you believe 
that I am the Son of God? Yes or no? And if you do believe that, then you will live this certain way. If you love me, if you love me, if you, are, if you possess charity towards me, you will keep my commandments. Once you make that act of faith, a whole cascade starts to develop, should develop, in the soul that wants to be pleasing to God, that wants to realize its destiny, uh, which is the beatific vision, that wants to behold and possess God as he is, and not just as a scientific idea or some theory, but possess him as a lover. Because that's what we're talking about here. Possess him as a lover. That soul will incline towards God. Now, hell. If this is the nature of a soul in communion with God in this life and moving toward the next, where that is ultimately realized and fulfilled, what is the nature of the soul in hell? What's the nature of the damned in hell? Well, everything that we have here is missing here. So to get back to our, there'll be lots of rock bands in hell. Yeah, but you won't like their music. <laughs> there is no relationship in hell. The souls in hell hate each other. They particularly hate, they particularly hate those souls whom they knew, who they knew here on earth, and they either participated in sin with them or were led into sin by them. They particularly despise them. Now, a lot of people, as we're talking about uh, the Lazarus and the rich man uh, parable from our Lord, uh, say, well, wait a minute, it couldn't have been hell that the rich man was in because the rich man said, well, if you won't send Lazarus over here with some water to put on the drip of my tongue, you know, so you quench the flames, even for a moment, at least send somebody to my brothers so that they won't be you know, misled and lead, leave horrible lives and blah, 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 and all that, and they wind up here too in this place of horrible torment. A lot of people say, well, wait a second, how could a soul in hell wish good for someone else? Oh, no, no, no. That, to give you an idea of just the nature of the damned, what's in their heads, that expression was not as no soul in hell has the ability to have compassion or uh, the desire for the well-being of another soul. Not possible. They've given that up. What the rich man wanted was not to have his own tortures increased by his brothers who would come to hell and torment him further. So the nature of hell is to be so hate-filled, to be so without hope, to want the destruction of others, that you could almost talk about a community of hell. Theologians actually call it the society of the damned. There's a disturbing term. The society of the damned. How do the damned relate to each other? They tear each other to shreds. They hate each other. They hate themselves and they hate each other. It's like a perpetual, never-ending state of suicide. And homicide, where you are constantly killing others and yourself. There is no night, there is no day, there is no morning, there is no evening. You just exist in this perpetual state. Now somebody had asked between the breaks, how could, uh, you know, how does this happen? How, do, how, do, how does this continue forever? This is the justice of God. What is justice? Justice is giving to somebody his due. That's it. 
So that that one uh, that one problem that uh, somebody had raised is another question. Uh, how do we how do you explain to people that you know God's not going to throw them into hell? That's right. God isn't going to throw someone into hell. That's not going to happen that way. The person chooses a certain path, and that path is ratified time and time and time again. Those choices are made over and over and over again to not be in a friendship with God by committing adultery, forsaking your duties as a father, as a mother, as a friend, as a, as a, as a Christian, as whatever it is. And as you push these things aside little by little by little, you become a certain person. And at death, if the absence of some particular grace uh, at death, which is always possible and we should always pray for, uh, but in the absence of that, in this hypothetical case, the person has died as a certain person. Here he is, John Horrible. God is not going to take this fellow's free will and... So if he, has, he dies with that will that he has for choosing evil, so he, that correct. bad will is... Right. Is yeah, this is not... That's exactly right. He's, he's, he's that's why he died for that long will. So well, yeah, it's, it's exactly. He, he's, he dies in this state because he wants to be in this state. Does anybody imagine, for example, if we lived 5,000 years instead of our customary 70, does anybody ever see that, uh, I hate using the example, I don't know what people use as an example for horrible stuff before World War II, but uh, <laughs> if Hitler lived to be 5,000 years old, because we all lived to be 5,000 years old, what would he, uh, do you ever imagine that one day he'd be like, oh, you know, I actually like the Jews today. Oh, I don't really be, want to rule the world anymore. People get in this groove, and they keep going, and they keep going. Can they step out of it? Sure. With grace? Absolutely. All things are possible. But as they continue to move along and move along, their will becomes committed. If they die in that state, God gives them what their free will has chosen. He simply ratifies for them for all eternity what they wanted while they were here on earth. We see death as this, some people see death as this kind of break and, uh, and then you go on to something else. No. Death is simply the end of the one phase where whatever you have chosen you are, has, is ratified for you for eternity. Death just kind of becomes the nuclear explosion of how you wind up for eternity. But it is not unrelated to life. For a soul who does not want to be with God, how horrible would it be for God to make that soul stand in his presence for eternity? The question is, from an earlier question we had, uh, it isn't a question of, of you know, why God you know, doesn't save the person. It's why doesn't the person get to the point of being able to be saved? That's the question. And as deep and theological and, you know, volumes and thousands of millions of pages have been written on that, doesn't it all just come right back to the very simple question of my will versus God's will? It's just that simple. You know, you notice when uh, Adam and Eve fell nowhere in there, unless you read some kind of twisted original Hebrew or Greek, nowhere in the book of Genesis, in the account of the fall, does our Lord send Adam and Eve off to a psychologist to have them examine what their motives were? And maybe Adam had had some bad fruit that day, and you know, he had a fight with Eve about something, and they weren't in the right mind. No, you made your decision. So these, kinds of, these are the kinds of things that are extraordinarily important for us to understand. Our will needs to be conformed to God. That does not happen without grace. It might happen, we, we might have our will conformed to the will of God for a short time, follow the moral order, but we will not be able to do that for our lives. So we need this constant reinforcement, constant 
pouring out of sanctifying grace, which is ours whenever we participate in a sacrament. That's what it is, a sacrament, an action of holiness, and the holiness being of God. So when we go to Holy Communion, we receive sanctifying grace. It is available to us. Do we, do we allow, do we receive the benefits of that grace? Do we open up our capacity to be able to do this? Yes or no? Well, if we do, how much? As we increase in sanctifying grace, we are preparing ourselves to step into grace itself, the author of grace, as we die. Normally throughout the course of our lives, for most people, uh, the, there's only, for most Catholics, the only sort of recurring opportunities we have with any sort of regularity for sanctifying grace is confession and Holy Communion. And that's why Mass is so desperately important, so desperately important. And to think that today, and this is good in America compared to Europe, three out of four Catholics don't even set foot in a church. Three out of four. Think about what you know about hell right now and then extrapolate that. Somebody or some bodies is responsible for that condition. Three out of four of our Catholic brothers and sisters don't give a hoot about going to Mass. And quite obviously the rest of the world doesn't either since they're not Catholic. These become troubling questions. People walking around in an objective state of mortal sin. Absolutely. Now, how culpable they are of that is that's for God to decide and God to judge. But it is a great evil to deliberately miss Mass on Sunday. Why? Because what is evil? Evil is the absence of what ought to be. What ought to be? What ought to be is that you want to be with God. Here is on earth is the closest you can be to God. Well, if you don't want to be to him on earth this close, how can you possibly say, oh, yeah, but when I die, I'll be with him. You didn't even want to be with him when it was over here. This is the point. And this is why as Catholics, you're all here. You all believe this. I'm not telling you something you don't know. I might be saying it in a way you haven't heard, you know, for, I don't know, some point in time or whatever, but that's beside the point. You all believe this. So... Our question is, what's the uphill battle that each of us is doing right now to convince, first of all, other Catholics about this? Some don't like it. You know, the, the reasons are myriad. You know, divorced and remarried, contraception, blah, 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 never told it, blah, blah. We did. Fine, whatever the reasons were, they were. What are you doing about it now? And this is our point. This is what we need to do as Catholics. You need to get out and you need to tell people this. You need to sit down, and no matter how much you get beat over the head, no matter how much you get laughed at and made fun of and, you know, called. Well, I can read through my emails and tell you what, the name, what names you get called. Um, <laughs> go on YouTube and read some of the, anyway. Um, but this is our truth. This is what we're called to do. And you just have to say it. And you have to, but you have to know it. You have to know it. This is why all of the great saints spent all this time meditating and contemplating and in prayer and everything. This is the point of this. So you become more like God. You know, and don't worry about striking out. Our Lord struck out. He cried over Jerusalem because he knew what was going to happen to it. There comes a point you do not worry about your success. You just worry about doing because in the doing, you are doing it for the love of God and you begin to love God as he loves himself. And that is your destiny. That is your destiny. Now, uh, I will close up with a very sobering thought. We'll say a prayer and come back for the next conference. But the sobering thought is that uh, uh, quite a number of theologians uh, in the history of the church have said that... Uh, when it comes to the damned, the, uh, regardless of whether the saved knew who they were or not in this life, child, parent, mother, brother, sister, uncle, if the uh, saved look down on the damned, even if they knew them and loved them in this life, they will rejoice at their damnation. 
because it is the will of God and the justice of God. Those are the stakes we're playing for here. Heaven is not just some earthly paradise with a, on steroids. Hell is not just some uncomfortable place where a bunch of bad people can hang out and drink beer and talk about how lousy life was. This is for keeps. This is the whole shooting match right here. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Sacred Heart of Jesus, Immaculate Heart of Mary, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.